Our epistle reading this morning, uh, we continue reading from the book of Hebrews. This morning we are in the ninth chapter, reading verses 24 through 28, which can be found on page 978 in your pew Bible, or if you'd like to follow along in your own Bible or your Bible app on your phone, uh, please feel free to do so. Let us attend to God's word for us this morning. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord our God, may the words of my mouth May the meditations of all of our hearts and our minds be made acceptable in your sight. For you alone are God, you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So when I was young, I used to like to make models. How many of the, the kids out here today, how many of you still make models? Any of you have, like, make model airplanes or whatever? Yeah, we have some, at least. A couple hands going up. Okay. Back, back in, in my day, and I don't know if they've changed now, but back when I was little, we'd go um, actually to the hardware store. They had model kits, and you'd buy a kit, and it'd have the plastic pieces in them, and you'd have to separate them from the plastic they were attached to, and, and it gave you directions on how to put things together. And I used to love making model planes, yeah. Made model other things too, and they, they were cool too, but model planes especially were fun. I'd make, you know, fighter jets and, and bombers, and um, I think I had a helicopter once. And you, you'd glue them together according to the instructions with this glue that smelled really bad. But you'd, you'd glue them together, and, and often they had decals you could put on and, and had paint, and we would paint them and make them look really nice. And, and my brothers and I liked to do this. My friends, uh, some of my friends did this as well. I liked to take those, those planes, and I'd hang them from my ceiling with, with fishing line so you couldn't see the line. And so they'd be, you know, like in a dogfight or something up above my bed. Those planes were really, really neat. There was a lot of detail on them. Some of them had had landing gears that that would open and close, or or cockpits you could open and close. But the thing about those planes is that they were were models. They were were copies. They weren't the real thing. Later on, as as, uh, as I grew up and saw more more things as, as my uh, brother became a pilot and, and now my, my nephew, who's a, a pilot with the Air Force. Learned that, you know, real planes are, they're, they're kind of like the model, you know. They, they look similar. They've got the, the same, you know, parts on them, but they're real parts. The real plane does so much more than the model actually can. The model's just, just a copy. And that is what our, our reading today tells us about the temple, about the whole mosaic system of laws. It was a copy. It was a, it was a model. It was pointing towards something more, something richer, something deeper. Yeah. Those model airplanes, you know, maybe I could move the gears up and down, but they didn't have hydraulic systems. Yeah. They didn't actually use jet fuel. They couldn't fly. They just hinted at that and allowed me to play at that. Okay. Well, in some ways, that's, that's what 
the Mosaic law and the, and the whole temple system was. They, they pointed to something more. They kind of gave us a, a, a placeholder as we were waiting for their fulfillment. And that fulfillment was in Christ. Everything that the system in the temple pointed to was a copy. But Jesus was the real deal, right? the real thing. The temple system gave a way of, of thinking about how we get right with God, okay? about what it means to be holy and to enter into God's presence, about how we are purified through, through the shedding of blood. But it was, a, it was a copy, it was a model. And you really, if you only have the model of a, of a jet plane, it's really hard to imagine what a real one's like. And from the temple system, you can only begin to imagine what the fulfillment would look like, what, what the Messiah, the Christ, would look like, that all of that pointed to. We couldn't really have guessed what he would do from the model. We only had hints. Jesus was the fulfillment of what the temple was all about. And once Jesus came, the temple wasn't needed anymore. And in fact, it no longer exists. But scripture tells us about another temple. And that temple isn't, isn't the one made of stone that was in, in Jerusalem that was a copy of heavenly things. Scripture tells us that we are a temple. That we as the church collectively are, are the place where God's spirit dwells. That we as individuals are a temple. And just like Jesus made, uh, made real what was hinted at in the temple system, he is bringing us into something that is more real. In many ways, our lives are well, they're, they're a model. They're a copy. They're a hint of what is to come. We are promised so much more than what we experience now. But what we experience now points to it. Yeah. Gives us hints of what is to come. The love we experience now, the forgiveness we experience now, the companionship, the, the joy in God's presence we experience now is a, a foretaste of what we will receive when Christ comes again in glory. We are, we are temples, but just, just models of the temple we will be. You know, one, of, one of the things I've never experienced, thankfully, is what some of you may have experienced. It's called identity theft. Have any of you ever been through that? I know people who have, and it's, it's kind of a horrible thing where people, somebody steals your identity. They take your, your social security number. They, they get into your bank account and your credit cards. And it's, it's an a extreme inconvenience as you have to redo all your accounts. And also a very, a very disconcerting thing for people who have been through it. But as Christians, we, we don't experience identity theft. Okay? We're experiencing the opposite, an identity gift. Okay? Christ, in calling us to a new way of life, to that Christian life, Christ isn't taking our identity from us, but he is giving us his identity. He is giving us all his resources rather than taking ours away. He is making us into what we are intended to be, which is him. Being Christians means being little Christ. And we grow more and more into that image, more and more into the real deal.
it's not always obvious. Sometimes we go through and we, we have a sense of what we're supposed to become, but we get discouraged. We know what we're being called to, but we don't seem to be making much progress. And yet that promise is there. That promise is there to encourage us and to keep us moving forward. I want to read to you something from, uh, it comes out of, of a book by Scott McKnight called The Jesus Creed. And in this book, McKnight shares a, a story about a woman named Margaret Alt. When Margaret was just about to complete her PhD at Yale, or excuse me, at Duke, she'd be upset if I said Yale, but um, as she was about to complete her degree at Duke, uh, something unexpected but really quite welcomed happened. She fell in love. She went on a date with a man named hyung Kim, and the proverbial sparks flew. And yet almost as those sparks became a fire, they were doused with water. Hyung-gu informed Margaret that he was HIV positive. Needless to say, Margaret was devastated. In her own words, she said, I just met someone I liked, and we were definitely not going to live happily ever after. I felt like I'd been kicked in the gut by the biggest boot in the world. And yet she and Hyung-gu were married. In his book, McKnight asked the question that, that many of us would ask. Why would anybody invite into the core of their being so much pain? And he then goes on to share how that answer unfolds in the rest of Margaret and hyung story. He writes this. When Margaret was in graduate school at Duke, she and hyung loved to walk in the Duke Gardens. And so knowledgeable did they become of its plants that they, were supervised, uh, that they supervised construction of a new project. They walked through each part of the garden routinely. They had names for some of the ducks. In their last spring together, that garden became especially beautiful to them. But hung Yu died in the fall, and Margaret returned to the gardens in the spring, where a memorial garden of roses was being constructed in his honor. McKnight goes on to point the readers to a series of quotations from Margaret's book, a book she entitled Sing Me to Heaven, where she reflects on those days in which she returned to the garden And she wrote, where peonies were promised, there were only dead stumps, dead stumps of last year's stalks. Where daylilies were promised, there were unprepossessing tufts of foliage. Where hostas were promised, there was nothing at all. And yet I know what lushness lay below the surface, whose beds there were so brown and empty, and to the unknowing eye so unpromising, that in a few months they would be bursting, And then she went on to ask, is the whole world like this? Is this what it might be like to live in expectation, real expectation of the resurrection? Was not Hyungu's and my life together like this, empty and sear, and yet a seedbed of fullness and life for both of us? He died and I was widowed, yet in his dying we were both made alive. And after quoting Margaret's words, McKnight concludes, where did she find the strength to grip such faith and hope? It is found in her question, is the whole world like this? The answer, yes, the whole world is like this. The whole world offers us tokens of new life beyond death and disasters. It offers the promise of new life beyond the grave a life of renewed love in the presence of God. Why? Because Jesus was raised from the dead. Sometimes our lives look anything like Jesus. We may be copies, but we feel like we are very poor copies. Like those first models I made where glue eased out of the of the seams, where decals were on crooked, where the paint splattered and didn't stay in the lines it was supposed to. Sometimes our lives feel barren 
and a mess. But we have that promise that Christ is doing something new. We may not see it. It may be like that tulip bulb we plant in the fall. But we wait for the spring, waiting for it to grow up and blossom and be beautiful. Brothers and sisters, as Christians, we know where we're going but we also know what we're becoming. That yes, we may be going to heaven, but we're being made like Christ, remade in his image. We are going to be the real deal, just what he made us to be. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.